Uh, hello, everyone. Uh, hello, and welcome to, uh, to today's uh, guest lecture. Our lecturer today is Dr. Thomas Papadopoulos from University of Cyprus. And Wukash Hila will, will first read his bio so that you know who is going to be speaking to you in a couple of minutes. Wukash, please present our today's lecturer. All right. So um, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, my name is Wukash Hila, and I have the pleasure to invite you to the already seventh meeting as part of this year's Capital Companies Academy. And today's topic is the screening of foreign direct investments through European company law. And from this place, we would like to thank all of you for your uh, presence and our guest lecturer for accepting our invitation to further enlighten us on the matter. And uh, hereby, it is my great honor to introduce our guest, Professor Thomas Popodopoulos, who is an assistant professor of business law at the Department of Law of the University of Cyprus. He received his doctorate of philosophy in law from the Faculty of Law, University of Oxford. He received a degree of Magister Juris and a degree of Master of Philosophy in Law from University of Oxford. He also received his LLB with distinction from the Department of Law, Aristotle University of Thessaloniki. Previously, he was a visiting researcher at Harvard Law School. He's also a visiting professor at International Hellenic University, an adjunct professor at Open University of Cyprus, and an attorney at law. Moreover, he is an editorial secretary of European Company Law. He was also visiting researcher at King's College London and at Max Planck Institute Luxembourg for international European and regulatory procedural law. So um, good afternoon, Professor, and uh, the floor is yours. Good afternoon. Uh, thank you so much for your kind invitation. I really appreciate that. Uh, it is my pleasure to and my honor to contribute uh, to this series of uh, lectures. Um, the topic of my presentation is uh, screening of foreign direct investments through European company law. Uh, this uh, paper uh, is uh, actually a book chapter uh, published in an edited book uh, with the title, The Common European Law of Investment Screening. Uh, this edited book uh, was uh, edited uh, by Professor Stephen Hiddelang from Uppsala University and Professor Andreas Moberg from uh, Gothenburg University. Uh, it, is, uh, it is the result of a quite extensive uh, research project on investment screening, uh, which was initiated after uh, or in the due course of the adoption of the investment screening uh, regulation at uh, EU level. Uh, the, uh, there was a conference in 2019 at Gothenburg University uh, where the various uh, papers were presented. Uh, actually, uh, if someone has the chance to see uh, the very chapters of this book, uh, would realize uh, that it uh, covers every angle of investment screening at EU level. So uh, it starts from uh, the theoretical uh, uh, framework, uh, the EU framework, the international economic law framework, the administrative law framework, and then it uh, tries to examine various areas of law. Uh, for example, uh, maritime um, investment screening, maritime law, telecommunications law, defensive industries, energy, uh, company law, my presentation, uh, banking law, competition law. Anyway, uh, if you have a look at the table of contents, you would uh, realize uh, the uh, scope, the wide scope of this project. Uh, so I had the chance to uh, wrote to uh, I had the, the chance to write this, this chapter for this project. Um, I gave uh, this. I sent this chapter to Maya before hand. So uh, after the uh, lecture. Uh, she can share uh, the chapter with you, um, and uh, I think I think now it's time to uh, to start with my presentation. Um, just a moment. Okay, I think I must share. Yes, if you could share your screen. Yes, and I will tell you if this is going fine. Now, yes. Yes, yes, I can read everything, so I think right. it should be fine for everyone. 
Okay, I'm glad this is working. Uh, so, as I said, uh, this presentation is based uh, first on uh, this book chapter, uh, but uh, I also uh, wrote another article uh, on this topic, uh, taking into account uh, the COVID-19 crisis. Uh, I also sent to Maya this article, which was published in International Trade Law and Regulation Journal by Susan Maxwell. The title is COVID-19 Crisis and Screening of Foreign Direct Investments in EU Private Debt Companies. Uh, so first, I'm going to uh, talk about uh, generally how uh, screening of FDIs could take place through European company law. And secondly, I'm going to uh, discuss uh, the COVID-19 uh, uh, crisis implications on FDI screening. So, uh, this paper examines how screening of our direct investments could take place uh, through European company law. Uh, it is divided into two uh, large uh, parts. First, uh, I'm going to uh, analyze the CG use case law uh, on corporate mobility and on golden shares, uh, how this CG case law uh, could screen for uh, direct investments, and also the second part uh, examines uh, how harmonization of European company law contributes to screening of foreign direct investments. And uh, as you see, uh, my uh, PowerPoint slides are uh, a little bit thick because I try to uh, explain uh, as widely as possible my arguments from this uh, book chapter uh, in order to give you the, give the chance to understand uh, better. Uh, these uh, these arguments. Uh, so uh, screening of uh, FDIs could take place through uh, European uh, company law, as we said, uh, the harmonization of company law, as well as the CG use case law, offer some mechanisms for this regard. EU company law includes certain instruments which could constitute effective screening mechanisms. Derogations to EU fundamental freedoms as interpreted by the CGU's case law. A corporate control mechanisms, requirements for transparency in capital markets uh, and disclosure of information in capital markets and various veto powers in corporate restructuring, harmonizing instruments are some examples. Uh, I would like to stress a quite important point here that all these company law instruments that I'm going to discuss here, both uh, case law and harmonization, could be used only indirectly for the screening, as their primary objective is the harmonization of company law and the promotion of the EU fundamental freedom of establishment, according to the legal basis, which is Article 50, Paragraph 2G. So, uh, we are bound by the legal basis in the treaty. Uh, the aim is specific, promotion of freedom of establishment, uh, protection of the interests of members and others, according to the legal basis of Article 50, Paragraph 2G. I remind you here that Article 50, Paragraph 2G is the legal basis for the adoption of harmonization of company law. So uh, all these instruments could be used only indirectly for screening. Um, and uh, although the primary objective is the protection of the interests of members and others, as we say, the, this is the legal basis for the adoption of harmonization of company law, the protection of the interests of members and others, they would also contribute significantly to an effective screening of foreign direct investment. At this point also, I would like to stress that, of course, uh, the European Union adopted the investment screening uh, regulation uh, uh, since uh, 2019, which uh, came into effect uh, in autumn 2020. Uh, nevertheless, uh, the investment screening uh, regulation uh, provides also the possibility to member states to adopt additional mechanisms, such as, for example, company law mechanisms. For investment screening. Uh, 
Moreover, some member states do not have investment screening mechanisms. Uh, from 27 EU member states, uh, only 15 EU member states have investment screening mechanisms. I think Poland has one investment screening uh, mechanism, as far as I remember from the uh, database of the European Commission, uh, because all member states must notify the European Commission their investment screening mechanisms to make sure that they comply with the EU legal framework. Uh, but first of all, uh, what does uh, investment screening mean? It's necessary to explain in advance what the term investment screening means in the context of European company law. The term investment screening has a twofold meaning in European company uh, law because it serves two objectives. And the public interest and the interest of shareholders and other stakeholders. This distinction derives from uh, the fact that European company law has as its primary objective the promotion of the EU fundamental freedom of establishment of companies. And as its secondary objective is complementary objective, as we say, investment screening. So uh, on, uh, on the one hand, investment screening in the context of the exercise of the EU fundamental freedom of establishment of companies and of the CG use case long corporate mobility is related to the assessment of uh, FDIs on grounds of public interest. Uh, so FDIs are evaluated, are examined in the light of public interest uh, to find out if, uh, for example, uh, what are the motives of a uh, dubious or hostile investor? Uh, is it controlled by a hostile government or not? Uh, I mean, uh, to see what is hiding behind the foreign direct, this foreign direct investment coming from a non-EU country. The CTEU's case law interprets the available justifications of restrictions of freedom of establishment of companies, which contribute to investment screening. Moreover, investment screening, in the light of privatization from Golden Search case law, takes place on the basis of public interest consideration. The CTEU explained under which conditions Golden Search could constitute justified restrictions on EU fundamental freedom and as a result could be lawful and could also serve as a screening mechanism. On the other hand, investment screening in the context of the harmonization of company law entails an assessment of FDI investments on the basis of both the protection of the interests of shareholders and other stakeholders and the protection of public interest, which is, as we said here, the priority. Uh, of uh, the investment screening through European company. And investment screening during a takeover bid assesses the bidder controlled by a foreign investor. In the context of the shareholder rights directive too, investment screening is related to the promotion of the interests of the company through encouragement of long-term shareholder engagement. For example, identification of shareholders, transmission of formation, facilitation of the exercise of shareholder rights. All these, all these issues are harmonized by shareholder rights directive too, and could also constitute effective investment screening mechanisms. I continue, disclosure of engagement policy and transparency, and approval of related party transactions. Investment screening in the framework of transparency directive encompasses an assessment of FDIs on the basis of investor protection and market efficiency, which include protection of dangerous of shareholders. In addition to that, corporate restructuring harmonizing instruments, for example, the cross-border merger directive and the European company statute. Investment screening comprises an assessment of the foreign direct investment on the basis of public interest. So, in this uh, PowerPoint, I included all harmonizing instruments of European company law that will be examined in the context of investment screening. So I will try to explain how the takeover bridge directive, the shareholder rights directive, 
the Transparency Directive and uh, the Cross-Border Measures Directive as consolidated into uh, Directive 2017-1132, as well as the uh, European Capital Statute contribute to investment spending. I will try to, 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 to uh, explain how all these harmonizing instrument, instruments that I have just mentioned uh, contribute to an effective investment screening at EU level. Hence, uh, it will be deduced uh, that investment screening in European Company law uh, takes place on two bases public interest and the interest of shareholders and other stakeholders. But what's the common denominator? What's the meeting point? The common denominator is that the interest of shareholders and other stakeholders is not always confined to the narrow limits of the company. Sometimes the interest of shareholders and other, there is a comment in chat. Uh, is your presentation the text of the speech or did you speak? Yes, it is, it is the text. I'm going to stop it. Uh, yes, it is the text I'm uh, referring to. Uh, is it visible or is there any problem with it? Is there a problem with the PowerPoint slides? Ah, all right, all right. Yes. I can share. I can share the PowerPoint slide also here in the chat if you wish. Just a moment. I'm going back to share the screen. Uh, all right, no problem. Oh, just a moment. Uh, professor, uh, we don't see your uh, your slides. Uh, it seems ah. that there is some technical issue. Ah, all right. I'm. I'm. I, I had just closed the PowerPoint and I opened it again. So okay. Maybe this time. Now, is it, is it, is it fine now? Yes, 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 it is. Right we now, yes. Right yes, now, yes, yes, I'm, yes I'm, we can see it. Right now, I'm changing slides. And right now, I'm at the slide. Hence, it would be deduced that investment screening in the context. Um, this is the slide that I'm explaining now. All right. So uh, if there is any technical problem, please let me know. Maybe there is an issue here. So no, no, everything know. is fine now. It's, yeah. it's all good. Right. Yes, that's fine. So, uh, so uh, sometimes uh, the interest of shareholders and other stakeholders touches the public interest. And this is very, this takes place quite often in the so-called strategic companies or national champions, as they call it, where the in, in such companies, uh, the interest of shareholders and other stakeholders is intervened with the public interest. So a, a strategic company or a national champion, uh, as, as it's called, it, 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 it is not like a regular company. It is not only Maybe you have heard about, of course, you, you, you know, the shareholder maximization uh, theory and all these things. For strategic uh, companies, we need something more. Strategic companies and national champions play a major economic, political, and social role in many member states, which affects significantly the public interest. The importance of such companies for the very the importance of such companies for the various national interests of member states gives sometimes the impression that the public interest is hiding behind the interest of shareholders and other state stakeholders. So, uh, in addition to the shareholders and stakeholders' interests, strategic companies also share public interest. Uh, for example, companies in strategic sectors of the economy, energy, telecommunications, uh, banking uh, sector, financial sector, uh, healthcare provision, especially nowadays, uh, pharmaceutical companies. Uh, all, these, uh, all these companies are considered to be strategic uh, companies. Uh, of course, defensive industries, everything uh, in this area. So screening is required for unwanted foreign investment. Uh, which might be detrimental both to shareholders 
and other stakeholders' interests and to public interest. Uh, actually, this means that member states are afraid that uh, hostile, unwanted foreign investors uh, are going to uh, take over uh, their strategic companies. And as a matter of fact, some uh, public interest, some national interest it will be threatened. Uh, in case of strategic companies and national champions, an investment screening taking place through European company law might reveal and sometimes frustrate unwanted foreign direct investment. So uh, European com company law could be used as a defense against unwanted foreign direct investments, hostile foreign direct investments. And here, I'd like to make a comment that in the uh, European Union, uh, there are various stances against foreign, foreign direct investments. Uh, some member states are quite concerned about who is hiding behind a foreign direct investment. Um, actually, the main concern, for example, is that uh, countries like China, for example, or, or some uh, Arabic uh, countries, uh, the Emirates, uh, Saudi Arabia, are hiding behind a uh, specific foreign direct investment. And this is uh, dangerous for their strategic companies and for their national interests. Uh, this is one stance. There's another stance. Some member states uh, do not really care uh, about who is hiding behind the foreign direct investment. Uh, sometimes this is uh, member states uh, who just want to attract uh, foreign direct investments uh, for the benefit of their national economy. Who, uh, so uh, they, they don't think that national uh, interests are in danger. Uh, this is the, uh, the uh, environment uh, at EU level and the stance uh, and the two different stance existing uh, at EU level uh, towards foreign direct investments. Now, a freedom of establishment of companies uh, and CG use case law. Uh, first of all, uh, an EU company set up in an EU member state by a foreign investor could benefit from an EU fundamental freedom of establishment. So we need so a foreign investor, a foreign investor, sometimes. Uh, sets up a company in one member state and then uh, provides the foreign direct investment through this EU company. For example, a uh, Chinese uh, investor uh, sets up a company in an EU member state, for example, in France, and then the whole FDI takes place in this company. In this case, uh, freedom of establishment of companies comes into play. Uh, because freedom of establishment of companies applies only to EU companies. It does not apply to non-EU uh, companies. In CG use case, no freedom of establishment of companies, member states put an effort in justifying on the basis of the available justifying grounds of the FEU or on the basis of the mandatory requirements of the general interest formulated by CG use case law, the various restrictions imposed by them on freedom of establishment of companies. The CGU applied also the well-known Gebhardt test here to these corporate mobility cases. It is the fourfold test uh, regarding justification of restrictions introduced by the, uh, the famous Gebhardt case. And now, uh, some, example, some examples of justifications invoked by member states, which could be uh, used as an investment screening mechanism against a foreign investor. Uh, for example, uh, the capital requirements reinforced financial soundness and protected public creditors. As unlike other creditors, they could not secure their debts through guarantee. Uh, for example, uh, from Sandra's case, uh, the risk of fraudulent bankruptcy uh, related to the insolvency of the company, following inadequate cap initial capitalization. From the Brazilian case, uh, creditor protection, minority shareholders protection, employees protection, uh, tax reasons. From Inspire Art, protection against fraud, uh, creditor protection, effectiveness of tax uh, inspections and supervision, uh, and fairness in business dealings. In CEVIC, uh, the creditor protection against shareholder interest, uh, the reasons are here more or less the same. Tax avoidance in mid-market expansion 
And of course, all these justifying grounds must comply with the principle of proportionality. Here, all these justifications, uh, which were put forward by the corporate mobility case law of the European Court of Justice, uh, could be used by member states as investment screening mechanism against uh, EU companies controlled by a foreign investor. All these categories of justifications uh, constitute public policy grounds under which an effective screening could take place. It should be noted that this is wide reading of screening, which aims at screening for sufficient capitalization, non fraudulent behavior, etc. Certain corporate activities or decisions of an EU company controlled by a foreign investor would be restricted lawfully. This screening on the basis of justified restrictions could stop an EU company controlled by a foreign investor to expand its activities at cross-border level, the establishment of agencies, branches, or subsidiaries in other member states. Uh, for example, in, uh, I, I, I mentioned pre just previous an example, we have, for example, a Chinese investor. Uh, the Chinese investor sets up a company in France and wants to expand throughout the European Union to set up uh, to this French company, agencies, branches, subsidiaries in various member states. Uh, it is possible for each member states to stop this expansion, to stop this uh, establishment of agencies, branches, or subsidiaries uh, by invoking this, the grounds that we mentioned before. Of course, principle of proportionality here applies, uh, and all uh, framework uh, that was uh, proclaimed by the case law of the uh, European Court of Justice, and purely economic considerations never serve as valid justifying grounds. For example, member state can never invoke budgetary grounds, uh, or for example, a measure is not uh, good for the national economy. Uh, so these grounds can never be accepted uh, as valid justifying grounds. Now, uh, uh, in addition to corporate mobility case law, uh, we also have the golden shares case law of the European Court of Justice, uh, which could screen for indirect investment. Uh, first of all, what's a golden share? What's a special share? Or golden shares or special shares are special rights and privileges that member states retain in certain privatized companies. Uh, there is no proportionality between capital and control, so the state usually keeps uh, a small uh, proportion of shares, sometimes just one share, which gives a uh, strong prerogatives, uh, strong, strong privileges to this state. Uh, the motive behind the introduction of these golden shares in privatized companies was the protection of public interest. Uh, and there are various types of golden shares, uh, for example, uh, the possibility to exercise veto rights, the possibility for the state to appoint board members, uh, to restrict acquisition of uh, shares beyond a specific percentage of shareholdings, holdings, etc. There are various types of uh, golden shares. Uh, this pursuit of public interest took more specific shapes. Uh, the main reasons put forward by member states for keeping ownership control uh, rights over a company after its privatizations include, first, to ensure that ownership and control of the company do not fall into hostile or undesirable hands, to ensure that the company retains its corporate purpose and jurisdiction, to prevent the sale of strategic and key company assets while retaining the current capital structure, to ensure that the new owners of privatized enterprises comply with certain commitments included in the sales agreement. And to guarantee the provision of services of general interest in sensitive sectors of the economy, to safeguard public security, public health, and national defense. That's the main reasons behind the introduction of gold. Uh, now, a uh, lawful gold, I mean, uh, since the 90s, and uh, there was a 
the certain cases decided by the European Court of Justice, uh, which uh, gave some guidance on which golden shares are lawful and which golden shares are unlawful. Uh, actually, uh, only in one case, in Commission versus Belgium, uh, the European Court of Justice found that uh, the Belgian golden shares were lawful. Uh, well, we're going to explain this case uh, in the following slides. Uh, but in general, lawful golden shares uh, might contribute to effective uh, spinning of foreign direct investment. But how a golden share could contribute to investment spinning? First of all, before the investment, golden shares uh, could dissuade, discourage unwanted foreign investors to participate in the capital of privatized companies. Uh, but even after the investment, golden shares, local golden shares could play a major role in investment spinning because uh, the state continues to exercise uh, control over the privatized company and to put some limits on the uh, activities of the foreign investor, who is now uh, the new shareholder in the privatized company. Uh, after the investment, after the privatization, uh, local golden shares uh, could block, for example, certain decisions of the privatized companies serving the political interest of the foreign investor. Uh, lawful golden shares could constitute also a means of uh, restricting the political influence over uh, the companies controlled by the foreign investor. Uh, State-owned companies, of course, uh, times are active in strategic areas of the, of the economy. And in privatizations of state-owned companies, where foreign investors are seeking to acquire their corporate control, golden shares compatible with internal market rules could constitute an effective screening mechanism. Uh, and the CGU had the chance to examine many national golden share schemes in privatization of state-owned companies. Uh, these golden shares were considered to infringe freedom, uh, freedom of capital and freedom of establishment. So in its golden share case law, the CGU structured the criteria under which a golden share scheme could be compatible with internal market rules. In all these cases, apart from one, and this one is Commission versus Belgium, member states failed to convince the CGU on the justifications for these infringements which they involve. Only in one case, in Commission versus Belgium, uh, the CGU found that the Belgian golden share schemes passed the test and the Belgian golden shares are justified. And as a matter of fact, they're lawful. The, the Belgian Golden Share Scheme had specific characteristics. Uh, for example, it was a system of ex post facto control. So uh, uh, the Belgian uh, representative uh, in the board of directors of the privatized companies uh, exercised its control after the decision was taken. Uh, there were specific administrative uh, safeguards, uh, time limits, uh, justification of the uh, exercise of the rights of the state, no arbitrary exercise. Uh, also, uh, judicial review of, uh, by the Belgian courts. So uh, the Belgian golden share scheme was deemed to be justified by the CGU. And as a matter of fact, as I have just mentioned, law. Uh, hence in Commission versus Belgium, the CGU stipulated the conditions under which golden shares could be justified, and as a result, could be lawful. Now, uh, privatization of state-owned companies also uh, presents some conflicts of interest. Uh, the first uh, conflict is the, entails the interest of private investors seeking to maximize the profits from such acquisition of shares, and the interest of the state pursuing political and social goals. 
So on the one hand, we have the private investor who wants to maximize uh, his profits. And on the other hand, the state is trying to serve public interest. The state is very rarely a typical financial investor. It always takes into account uh, public interest or other political considerations. Uh, the second conflict uh, is the case of imperfect privatization. What's imperfect privatization? It's the case when the private investor is another state-owned company. So a foreign state-owned company acquires shares in a state-owned company under privatization. This uh, quite often takes place with regard to Chinese companies. So when there is a privatization in, uh, when there is a privatization of a state-owned company in uh, a member state of the EU, a state-owned company from China, uh, or sometimes also from the Emirates, uh, comes into play and acquires shares in this EU state-owned company under privatization. These are called imperfect privatization. Uh, because actually it's not a transfer of the activities from public sector to private sector because still there's an element of, 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 of public uh, law coming from the uh, foreign investor who is a state-owned company. Uh, maybe you have uh, heard the discussion about Huawei, uh, the telecommunications company, uh, which uh, there's a big discussion about this. Uh, this is a uh, formally a private company, but there are, of course, uh, some 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 uh, suspicions that it is controlled by the Chinese uh, government. But this is a big discussion, of course, uh, in Europe and also in the US. Uh, so uh, now uh, let's move to the second part of the presentation in order to finish on time. Um, harmonization how harmonization of European company law contributes to screening of foreign direct investments. Uh, we mentioned before that uh, harmonization uh, plays a complementary role, of course, uh, and uh, screening uh, of foreign direct investments is only a secondary goal of harmonization because the primary goal of harmonization of European company law is the protection of the interests of members, i.e. shareholders and others. So this is a primary goal of the harmonization of European company law, to protect the interests of shareholders and others. Of course, uh, as a secondary objective, investment screening could also be served. Now, let's give a look at uh, the first harmonizing instrument, which is the takeover bid directive. Investment screening in the context of takeover bids constitutes the assessment of the potential bidder controlled by a foreign investor and the possibility of frustrating its bid and ultimately the acquisition of control of the target company. This investment screening is very important when the target company is a strategic company or a national champion of a member state. First, the takeover bid directive contains certain provisions uh, capable of screening the identity of the bidder, the conditions of the bid, and the plans and intentions of the bidder towards the target company after a successful takeover bid. Secondly, the takeover bid directive allows, under certain conditions, the adoption of defensive measures by the target company's board capable of frustrating the hostile bid, behind which a foreign investor is found. So we have uh, two aspects here. So the, the interest of target companies, shareholders in a takeover uh, could be affected adversely by the acquisition of target companies controlled by hostile bidder, especially when its plans are detrimental to the value of the company. Uh, however, sometimes in case of takeover bids towards strategic companies or national champions, public interest could be also affected indirectly by the negative and harmful plans of the bidder, 
towards the target number. Strategic companies and national champions uh, very often serve public interest consideration in addition to the protection of interests of their shareholders and other stakeholders. When a strategic company or a national champion is a target of a bid launched by a hostile bidder, which is controlled by a foreign investor, the protection of public interest is concealed behind the protection of the interests of the target company's shareholders. Uh, the, now, the main problem here, uh, the acquisition of corporate control of a strategic company or of a national champion by a hostile or at least dubious bidder, which is controlled by a foreign investor outside the EU, might endanger certain vital national interests served by, for example, uh, by, for example, national defense, uh, national security, energy security, telecommunication, uh, transport, various utilities and networks. Uh, some examples of these dangers for strategic companies and national champions are the following. For example, after a successful takeover bid, we have a seat transfer out of a particular member state. Uh, after a successful take takeover bid by a hostile investor, we have divestment of activities and assets or collective redundancy. Uh, the new, uh, the successful bidder uh, who had acquired control of a strategic company proceeds to collective redundancies or technology transfer. Uh, this uh, is quite uh, an issue for some uh, member states. Uh, for example, maybe um, some for some uh, member states with um, uh, technology companies, uh, this is a very, very big issue. Uh, they're afraid that a foreign investor is going to take over some of their uh, technology uh, companies. Uh, and uh, this foreign investor, uh, after taking control of these companies, is going to transfer technology uh, to his own country. Uh, yes, we cannot hide it that this, then, this, the, the, this fear is uh, mainly against the Chinese and sometimes against US uh, companies. Uh, additionally, loss of tax revenues, uh, uh, control of networks. Uh, or supply chains, especially nowadays with the uh, pandemic. Uh, control of uh, natural resources, uh, winter gap or liquidation, bankruptcy, fraud, strategic bankruptcy, or even money laundering, or maybe terrorist financing. There are many uh, grounds. Uh, the takeover risk directive here contains certain provisions, uh, which include both disclosure of certain information about the bid, and the bidder and the possibility of frustrating uh, the bid. Uh, here, yes, it's a big discussion to take over. And there are many, many case studies here. Uh, maybe you have heard about the robotics uh, company in Germany uh, and the takeover by a Chinese uh, company and all this discussion. Uh, anyway, there are quite a few case studies here about takeovers of such companies. Uh, the investment screening could protect the interests of target companies shareholders, but it could also protect indirectly public interest in case of strategic companies or national champions. First, this investment screening identify uh, and reveal the profile of the unwelcome bidder. Who is the unwelcome bidder? Secondly, uh, it allows under specific conditions the possession of the bid. So, takeover bid directive would contribute. Uh, uh, there are two ways of contributing. Uh, the first one is to, to um, uh, make the profile of the unwelcome bidder, who is the unwelcome bidder, what's the plans of the unwelcome bidder, and secondly, uh, also to frustrate uh, such hostile bid. Uh, in the context of listed companies, uh, the takeover bids directive uh, could be used for screening of foreign direct investments. Uh, there are two main provisions. Uh, the board neutrality rule, uh, the board must uh, stay neutral during uh, the period allowed for the acceptance of the bid. 
and the breaking rule uh, under which certain restrictions on the transfer of shares or voting rights uh, are disapplied here. Both of these provisions are optional according to Article 12. Uh, this is a peculiar characteristic of uh, the takeover bits di directive. In addition to optionality, there is a reciprocity system. Uh, the adoption of both optionality and reciprocity systems by member states uh, during the implementation of the takeover bits directive gives the listed companies the possibility to frustrate hostile takeovers by bidders controlled by unwanted foreign investors. So both the optionality regime and the reciprocity regime uh, give the possibility to the target company uh, to uh, defend itself against hostile bidders. Uh, there is a possibility. In case of an opt-out, because we mentioned that the breakthrough rule and the board neutrality rule are optional, in case of an opt-out from the board neutrality rule, the board of the target company could screen and reject an unwelcome foreign direct investment made through a takeover bid. In case of an opt-out from the board neutrality rule, the screening and the decision whether to reject a foreign direct investment made through a takeover bid is vested in target companies' board and not in target companies' shareholders. So in, in, in case of an opt-in, on the other hand, of course, uh, the decision uh, belongs to the shareholders. So the shareholders uh, can decide, can examine and decide whether to accept the bid. So in this case, the screening of the bidder, uh, the screening of the foreign direct, of the screening of the foreign investor behind the takeover bid is conducted by the shareholders. The shareholders examine the offer of the foreign investor uh, to buy their shares and decide. Uh, although the board neutrality rule does not allow the board to adopt independently defensive measures, it does not require the board to remain completely inactive. So the board could look for the so-called white knights. Uh, so in such a case, the board also screens the white knight and decides that it is really a white knight and invites the white knight to submit a competing bidder, which is a friendly one. Uh, of course, uh, the uh, opinion of the board is quite important. The board of directors during uh, the board of directors of the target company has the right to issue an opinion uh, about the bid. So this opinion sometimes uh, affects uh, the stance of the shareholder towards the bid. Um, we have Article 9, Paragraph 5 here. Uh, so again, uh, this opinion of the board uh, during a takeover bid contributes to an effective screening. Uh, this non binding consultative opinion of the bid expressed by the board of the target company could be very useful for strategic companies or national champions, which are the target of a hostile bidder jeopardizing certain public interests shared by such companies. In addition to that, the takeover bids directive contains some very useful provisions about disclosure of information takeover bids and screening of foreign direct investment. First of all, the offer document that the bidder prepares. The offer document must contain certain information about the identity and the plans of the bidder. Uh, so uh, uh, the takeover bids directive obliges the bidder to disclose its plans and intention regarding the target company. So again, this is a quite effective screening mechanism. Uh, this is a disclosure obligation. Of course, uh, important information concerning bids are coming from this. Uh, this is a disclosure obligation for the pre-offer announcement, as well as during and after the offer announcement. Uh, very briefly here, uh, the information uh, that the offer document must include 
concerns the identity of the bidder, uh, the financing of the bid, where does the money come from? <laughs> That's important. Are they coming from a non-EU member states? Are they coming from uh, China, from Russia, from uh, Emirates, from US, from uh, uh, Turkey, from Latin America, from Australia, from where? So the financing of the bid is an important element of, for the screening. Uh, other information contained in the offer document, uh, the status and the intentions of the bidder, uh, of course, all this must be included in the, in the document. And of course, additional information uh, here. Um, this document uh, must be, depending on the implementation of the directive, uh, require prior approval uh, by national supervisory authorities. So there is, of course, uh, supervision exercised by the supervisory authorities, the Capital Markets Commission here. And of course, uh, political considerations play a quite important role here. Uh, we have uh, uh, always takeovers are political, uh, and always uh, there is discussion about protectionism here. Uh, I would like to move a little bit. Uh, some member states have already adopted special national legislation for the screening of foreign direct investments, which could interact with the national takeover rules implementing the takeover directive. For example, France and Germany uh, has done so. Now, uh, let's move to the rest of the uh, harmonizing instruments. We also have the Shareholder Rights Directive. The Shareholder Rights Directive 2 contributes to an effective screening of foreign direct investment. First, uh, there are provisions uh, in the Shareholder Rights Directive 2, there are provisions for the identification of shareholders. So, uh, a member state uh, could identify the shareholders of certain specific strategic companies. So uh, shareholders uh, from non-EU member states cannot hide behind intermediaries. Uh, indirect source of control over a company and the way this control is exercised as well as the motives behind such control could be identified and screened. Some foreign investors who are considered to be unwelcome in specific member states hold shares in EU companies of such member states through complex change of intermediaries, uh, resulting in difficulties to identify them as shareholders. So intermediaries cannot be used anymore as a cover for an unwelcome foreign investor uh, holding shares in an EU company. Also, the Shareholder Rights Directive 2 uh, obliges uh, uh, the shareholders and the intermediaries to disclose their engagement policy. Uh, these foreign investors must disclose specific aspects of their plans for the investee company. So the various plans and incentives of the foreign investor must be disclosed in the context of this harmonized uh, framework. The shareholder rights directive two harmonizes also related party transactions. Uh, this is quite important. It's article 9C of the shareholders rights directive two. Uh, the problem with related party transactions uh, is uh, that shareholders are lacking adequate information uh, in advance of this plan transaction and quite often do not have any mechanisms allowing them to object abusive related party transactions. The problems could be solved also by enhancing the control rights of related party transactions. Uh, transparency and approval of related party transactions are crucial for investment screening between the investing companies and other subsidiaries of the foreign investors. And how and, and when is this taking place? This is taking place often in technology transfer. These provisions could restrict transactions planned by the foreign investor and aim it at technology transfer or even asset stripping of the investing company. So the foreign investor acquires control of the company and then gets its technology or assets, uh, and uh, this is quite negative for the investing company. Also, the transparency directive uh, has uh, disclosure obligations, disclosure of major shareholdings, uh, the disclosure of any changes with regard to major shareholdings contributes to a careful screening of structure of corporate ownership, the knowledge of shareholder composition, of course, 
uh, it is quite important. It is an effective disclosure of major shareholding, which is quite important for strategic companies. Uh, disclosure from persons with the possibility of influencing voting rights. Uh, so this is quite important. Uh, some member states move beyond the disclosure obligations. Uh, and for example, the investor notification of India. Now, another, uh, th this is the last area of harmonization of company law that I'm going to mention is the corporate restructuring harmonizing instruments. In the cross border merger directive, uh, repealed and consolidated into Directive 2017-1132, as well as in the European Company Statute, uh, it is possible for member states to block the process of a cross-border merger or of the establishment of a European company or of the transfer of the registered office of a European company when such processes are against public interest. So public interest considerations could stop a cross-border merger or the setting up of a European company. Again, this is an effective screening mechanism. Uh, and uh, this is something quite important also for uh, both for cross-border measures and the European company statute. Uh, now, a few words as a conclusion, a few words about the COVID-19 crisis and screening of our direct investments in EU private companies. It is interesting to examine uh, how uh, golden shares constitute an effective investment screening mechanism, the protection of an EU strategic privatized companies from dubious and hostile foreign direct investments during the COVID-19 crisis. Uh, this investment screening is essential in order to secure that the foreign direct investment would not jeopardize the services of general interest offered by these privatized companies during the COVID-19 crisis. Uh, the recent pandemic, as you already know, resulted in a quite important uh, financial crisis also, in addition uh, to the health crisis, there's also an ongoing financial crisis. Uh, the uh, COVID-19 crisis presents an increased risk to strategic companies of many member states, offering services of general interest to EU citizens. Uh, for example, energy, public transport, telecommunications, postal services, water, media, defense, industry, natural resources, and healthcare industries. Uh, the European Commission uh, was uh, quite concerned uh, about this and uh, issued uh, a communication in 2019, in 2020, uh, I'm sorry, last year. It was a communication providing guidance to the member states concerning project investment and free movement of capital from third countries and the protection of Europe's strategic assets ahead of the application of the uh, regulation EU, the FDI screening regulation. So the European Commission was really, really concerned. First of all, many of EU strategic companies uh, are depreciating during the COVID-19 financial crisis. So it is an easy target for foreign investors. Secondly, uh, the health industry. Uh, uh, in its communication, the European Commission urges member states without a special investment screening mechanism to adopt full-fledged screening mechanism, and in the meantime, to consider other available options, other available options in full compliance with union law and international obligations to address cases where the acquisition from or control of a particular business infrastructure or technology would create a risk to security or public order, including health security in the EU. Here, an interesting case study is the BioNTech uh, acquisition. I don't know if you have heard about it. Uh, there was uh, an effort uh, to take over BioNTech, uh, which is the collaborator of uh, Pfizer uh, for the um, production, uh, discovering production of the vaccine against uh, COVID-19. Anyway, Golden Shares could play an effective role as an alternative. Uh, the criteria of Commission versus Belgium uh, with regard to which golden shares are lawful are quite useful here and could constitute a quite effective screening mechanism. Uh, I don't want to expand more because more or less this discussion about uh, private companies, uh, I, 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 I put some emphasis uh, before. 
uh, the acquisition or control uh, of strategic privatized companies by dubious and hostile foreign investors might endanger the provision of such services to EU citizens. The depreciated strategic privatized companies with valuations or capital markets that are considered well below their true or intrinsic value might attract the interest of such dubious and hostile foreign investors from outside the EU. So golden shares can play a quite important role here. Now, a uh, conclusion. It is obvious that European company law could play an important role in investment screening, uh, both positive and negative integration in the area of European company law could provide the tools for screening a foreign direct investment, both case loan harmonization in the context of European company law paved the way for an effective screening of foreign direct investment. Freedom of establishment of companies as interpreted by the CGU's case law on corporate mobility could contribute to screening of foreign direct investments. Lawful golden shares, as well as harmonization of company law could play a quite important role here. We have various harmonizing instruments. We mentioned the takeover business directive, uh, the takeover business directive with its optionality and reciprocity regime contributes to an effective investment screening. Uh, additionally, the disclosure obligations contained in the takeover business directive could also contribute to investment screening. We also mentioned that the shareholder rights directive too and the transparency directive could also contribute to investment screening. Uh, we mentioned uh, briefly that corporate restructuring harmonizing instruments, such as the cross border merge directive, which was repelled and consolidated into directive 2017 1132, as well as the European company statute, uh, have specific mechanisms which allow member states to veto and to block. Uh, a cross-border merger or the setting up of a European company on the basis of public interest consideration. And of course, COVID-19 crisis and screening of foreign direct investments in EU privatized companies could take place through lawful, uh, golden, uh, through lawful golden search. So uh, thank you very much uh, for your attention. Uh, I hope I did not violate the uh, time limits. No, no, not at all. Uh, I try to to be as concise as possible, but I think I prepared uh, more uh, PowerPoints uh, than uh, I estimated that I could present. Yeah, Professor, thank you so much for your presentation. The lecture was splendid uh, as it cast some more light onto the topic. And um, now I believe that Professor uh, will be willing to answer questions any one of you yes, might ponder. Of uh, so please uh, raise your hand uh, using the icon or, or put your question via the chat, please. Yes, yes, please. Uh, there's a question from uh, Anne-Marie. Yes. Hello, Anne-Marie. Hi, um, I hope you can hear me. And yes. Okay, perfect. Yes, please. yes so uh, first of all, thank you very much for, for uh, this interesting uh, presentation. I must say that, um, you know, the topic has gained so much momentum in light of the <clears throat> protectionist tendencies that, that were uh, revealed by the COVID-19 pandemic. So really congratulations of just having the perfect timing with that. <laughs> Uh, that's that's very valuable um, in our profession. So that's great. Um, so uh, one general thought I have um, as regards uh, the chapter uh, is actually a thought about the the ever recurring problem in EU law in general. So um, being the challenge uh, of taking into consideration the very uh, divergent state of play in the particular member states and also the different path dependencies we see. So um, this means that uh, the conclusions uh, you presented uh, in your chapter may probably resonate quite differently with scholars depending on their uh, in-depth uh, knowledge of uh, the particular um, jurisdiction. So uh, speaking about Poland, 
uh, as you're probably aware, uh, our history of uh, privatization uh, has painted a quite unique canvas. So uh, being, you know, still the biggest publicly traded uh, companies, you know, on our Warsaw Stock Exchange, that are controlled um, by the state uh, through special mechanisms which allow the state to hold uh, around 25% of the equity and still have controlling power. In addition to that, we have uh, at the moment a um, very protectionist political climate that favors um, the extension of the state's influence on the economy through private law channels, that is also company law. So, um, you know, the, the, the part of your chapter that obviously uh, caught most of my attention was um, the idea of the use of, of golden shares. Um, as I have also uh, in, in the past spent quite some time on investigating um, the problem of corporate governance in state controlled companies as it is, as it is you know, quite you know, unique and, 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 and different from what we will uh, call standard corporate governance. So again, uh, talking about path dependencies, um, the idea of institutionalizing golden shares as a screening mechanism um, might probably, you know, raise some some initial discomfort with with, um, for example, scholars familiar with that kind of you know um, background we we just have in Poland. So um, I guess it it actually you know boils down to to the very fundamental question of uh, whether and if yes, how public policy can be pursued through private law institutions and mechanisms. And, um, you know, I, I think this question is very strongly, at least in, you know, the Polish context, um, I feel it's very closely tied to the problem of uh, accountability of, um, you know, political actors. So um, I guess we can all agree uh, that uh, we want to have effective screening mechanisms and, you know, we need it for, for the, the internal market to function. But necessarily, we also need political decision makers to be accountable for the decision making process within the screening itself, you know, so um, it seems that when the state acts in its traditional role, um, when we use those, you know, screening mechanisms through competition law and so on, um, the, you know, scrutiny on the decision making process is um, much more clearer in, in, in also what we know on you know, making public policy and implementing public policy, then uh, if the state acts as a shareholder, um, I guess it opens a huge pool of questions, uh, which um, basically also goes back to, to the corporate interest debate, because when we have a, uh, the state as a shareholder in the company like, what we call the interest um, of the company and how do uh, the, pull, uh, the, the public goals the state necessarily has as an actor, as a shareholder, how does it combine with the interests of, you know, the other shareholders? So it's, it's like um, an additional uh, aspect you just have to take into um, consideration. Um, but um, this, this, is, uh, this is, of course, um, uh, not a critique, like uh, on the contrary, it just shows um, how much of, uh, you know, an exciting and, and challenging uh, topic you're, you're pursuing here. So again, uh, congratulations on that. And probably, you know, the, the extent on, of doing research on that topic is not, uh, it's, it's not done yet. So there are so many aspects they have to see. And yeah, again, thank you very much. And that's all from me. Thank you so much uh, for your comment and your question. Of course, it's a very useful feedback. Uh, yes, I agree. Uh, actually, I think uh, uh, the position of the state as a shareholder must be examined on a case by case basis. Of course, we have the 
OECD principles of um, corporate governance of state-owned companies, all these things. But we must see this on a case-by-case -case basis, of course. And uh, I think it's not only law here, it's also politics, according to my point of view. Recently, I read a paper uh, from uh, about um, a scandal from Norway, a state-owned company. And uh, now I think in Norway, they plan or they have already, I don't remember exactly, some rules of how the state should act as a shareholder. Uh, there are some guidelines. Uh, yes, it depends, of course, on the state. Um, uh, for example, I can I can give an example from uh, Greece, where Greece had an extensive program of privatizations because of the bailout agreement of 2013 after the euro crisis. Uh, for example, uh, the, the only a state-owned company which could not be privatized completely is the water supply. In the water supply, there was a Suez, the French company wanted to acquire the control of the Athens uh, water supply state-owned company. Uh, but the Supreme Court uh, said that 51% uh, of the capital must always belong to the state. But this is only for water supply companies. For the rest of the state-owned companies, they could be uh, privatized. Energy, telecommunications, etc. Anyway, uh, I think it is it is uh, something that could be examined on a case by case basis. Uh, um, there are also interesting papers examining the position of Brazil as a shareholder in uh, state-owned companies, especially in the oil industry. Um, but yes, yes. Uh, Thank you so much for your Thank you. Time. Thank you so much. Thanks. Does uh, anyone else uh, have any question to, to our guest? Uh, if I don't guess, if, if there is no question. Uh, Hello, Adil. I hope you hear me. Welcome from the kitchen, just hiding from my, my kid. Uh, so if you nice. listen some screaming, it's, it's, it's from another room. Uh, but I have a very short question to you, uh, because you mentioned many uh, measures uh, that allows control some foreign investment. And uh, my general question is, do you feel that we are in the some kind of state of uh, equilibrium, uh, there is no need to change anything, or uh, do you imagine that something uh, we need to change, to introduce something new, uh, new measures? Mm, because all these measures you mentioned today are very specific, they are acting in a very specific uh, situation. And do you feel that there is a need to introduce, for example, some general mechanism, like uh, I have I had already this occasion to ask you about you, this anti-abuse measures in, in the case of cross-border restructuring procedure. And do you feel that uh, it would be wise to introduce uh, a kind of a measure like Anne-Marie uh, mentioned, for example, in the form of uh, definition of the interests of public companies that all companies established in the US, in the EU, uh, European Union must act in some way in the interest of public, uh, wise or not. It would be bad for the economy of uh, European Union. What do you think? Yes, I think, I think, yes, I agree with you. I think it would be a good idea, uh, this thing, to have a common definition and to go with this. We have, of course, the guidance. <clears throat> We have, of course, the guidance from the case law. Uh, but uh, this is sometimes not really adjusted to the case that uh, we're interested in. Uh, but I think, yes, this is uh, a, good, a, a very good idea. And recently, there's a big discussion about the corporate purpose and how all that. And, and, and I think this, this uh, thing that you just mentioned could be part of this uh, bigger discussion about the corporate purpose and all these things. Uh, and uh, recently, we see the initiatives of the European Union about uh, corporate accountability and all these things. 
uh, I think this uh, sparks the discussion uh, about these issues. And um, but yes, I agree with you. I agree with, 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 with it's a very interesting topic, which is of course related with the issue of abusive practices and all these things. Uh, but yes, it's, I, I think it's a very good idea, and I agree. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Are there any other questions from our audience? Okay, I'll, I'll count to, to five and if, if there are no more questions, we will uh, bring our lecture to the conclusion. Thank you. Thank you so much for your uh, interest in this topic. And I uh, really appreciate that you attended my lecture. All right, uh, seemingly there are no more questions. So uh, this brings today's lecture to an end. Uh, thank you very much, Professor, for your lecture thank and you uh, congratulations on all the important issues that uh, you, have, you have raised and all the remarks uh, that you have made. And um, see, you, see you next year, hopefully, or yeah. some, on some other occasion, maybe. Yes, of course. Uh, I visited already twice uh, Poland uh, for two conferences, one in uh, Warsaw and another in Krakow. And uh, it is uh, the conferences were excellent and also both cities were very beautiful and nice. Perfect. Thank you. Thank you very much. And thank you all for, for attending the, the today's lecture. Okay. Bye-bye. Take care. Goodbye. Good night. Bye.